Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College, University of London. I'm Mark Pennington, the Centre Director, and I'm pleased to say that we have with us today Michaela Novak. Michaela is based in a School of Sociology at Australian National University um, over in Canberra in Australia. She works at the intersection of political economy and sociology, and she's written two books, Inequality, an Entangled Political Economy Perspective, with Palgrave, and just out, Freedom in Contention, Social Movements and Liberal Political Economy with Lexington Books. So welcome, Michaela. It's great to have you with us here today. It's a great pleasure, uh, Mark. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. So, well, you've got this new book out, um, which is about social movements. And by that, as I understand it, you mean the type of loosely knit network structures that press for various socio but that we can't equate with categories such as say political parties or interest groups so i'd like to start off by asking you why you wanted to write a book about these movements at the present time is this just a long-standing interest or is there something about the present political moment that's brought the relevance of these movements more to the fore Look, I, I think uh, my interest in the study of uh, social movements and their interpretability uh, through uh, frameworks of liberal uh, theorization are both uh, long-standing in character and, and also reflect uh, the, the notion uh, which is attested by empirical evidence, uh, for example, produced by uh, Erica Chenoweth in the United States, that uh, there has been recent increases in protest and other um, social movement related activity. The long-standing interest in social movement uh, movements as outlined in my book uh, sort of derives from the fact that um, not on every occasion, but at certain, certain crucial moments in historical time and in place, uh, social movements have acted oftentimes uh, in contentious interaction with other actors within society to effectively push uh, for pro-liberty changes um, on economic lines, on political lines, and on social lines. But if, if you allow me to uh, just return back to the contemporary interest, um, there is a school of thought uh, in popular and also in scholarly circles suggestive of a notion that uh, we live in the, a golden age of protest, a golden age of social movement activity. And so um, if to the extent that this is true, and I suspect it may well be, it certainly warrants investigation. Uh, in its um, own right. Another important dimension of social movement activity uh, takes from uh, Dick Wagner's entangled political economy perspective when we appreciate that social movement participants engage in a, a fractious and contentious manner with a, a wide array of actors, political, including legislators, bureaucrats, judiciary, uh, they engage with other businesses, uh, they sort of pressure uh, businesses to, uh, uh, to invoke economic change. And social movements also have their adversaries within society known as, uh, known as counter movements. And another, just a final aspect that's really intriguing about the nature of the interaction, there is some, uh, some suggestion, and certainly within social movement literature to the effect that actually other actors in society for example, professional interest groups or paragovernmental organizations are actually taking on some of these repertoires of contention that are, that are conventionally associated with social movements. So, for example, interest groups or, you know, paragovernmental groups like unions and like, they will organize pickets, protests, strikes, boycotts and like. Uh, so what we really have an effect, I think, in the social movement form uh, is... A, a very fascinating, fluid, improvisational and quite peculiar in its own ways form of uh, collective activity that warrants uh, investigation, which I hope which I hope to have done adequately done in my book. Oh, that's great. So uh, um, let me just follow up on on something that you were saying there about the way that maybe interest groups are 
to some extent sort of absorbing some of the kind of tactics perhaps that social movements um, use. I mean, does that mean that the kind of learning that takes place across these different spheres between what social movements do and what interest groups do means that you kind of have a blurred space where it's actually quite hard to distinguish uh, almost one from the other that they're sort of becoming almost hybrid type forms as this kind of learning takes place. Yes, I, I explicitly acknowledge in the book drawing on some uh, very recent developments in organizational sociology and also uh, the broader social movements literature and acknowledgement of this organizational and strategic and tactical hybridity uh, which is going on in society. And what it actually does, and it made a little, little bit of a challenge uh, with respect to uh, the production of my book, it, it, uh, it basically defies a sort of a, a simplistic or a unifying definition of what a social movement is, because hmm. movements, the, the, the nature of the participation, the reasons, the rationale for by which activists want to engage in social movement activities and the way in which uh, these collectivities engage with others uh, do radically change over time. If we want to investigate uh, social change right at the coalface, so to speak, uh, I think social movements are, are an ideal candidate for those very reasons that uh, different actors in society uh, tend to co-opt and learn from in a Bloomington way uh, and also in an Austrian way, uh, the, the methods by which social movements uh, have succeeded or even how they have failed uh, in their sort of objectives to drive for social change. Okay, that's great. So. If I just go back, I mean, you did say um, in your opening remarks quite explicitly, and this is very clear in the, the opening of the book, that you're looking at these movements from a liberal political economy perspective. And in some ways, it's quite striking that very few people within that tradition, we can go on to unpack what we mean by that tradition perhaps in a little while, but very few people within that tradition have actually really studied social movements in any kind of, of, of depth. Um, and I think that it, it comes across very clearly in, in your book that, you know, this is a, a gap in the market, if you like, that really needs to be filled. And I think your book uh, does fill it. But I wonder if you could just comment on why you think it's the case that so few people within that tradition have really explored this phenomenon. Um, to be fair, there are sporadic uh, studies within uh, by produced by adherents of the liberal, liberal tradition or uh, sort of allied uh, scholars. I can think of, for example, a re reasonably early paper in the late 1960s by Albert Breton, a uh, late Canadian economist, uh, who uh, produced a supply and demand analysis, uh, I believe, in the American Economic Review uh, of Social Movements. Now, we also, uh, around that time, we saw um, an interesting treatment uh, of uh, the effects of social uh, movements uh, in the American education system by the great James Buchanan uh, in, in 1970 and there were associated pieces in uh, 71. You'll also see some sporadic uh, treatments, for example, in public choice journal, um, in the public choice journal over the years. Uh, needless to say that I do uh, subscribe to the, to the view that uh, there, was certain, there certainly has been substantially a gap uh, in analytical uh, literature in terms of liberal engagement with uh, the social movement form of collect intentional collective activity. And I wonder whether uh, this is driven to some extent by uh, either uh, a generic uh, liberal focus, uh, especially of the last during the last quarter of the 20th century upon economic concerns and political economy concerns, given you know, the clear and obvious needs which were revealed uh, post-war for the need to reform and liberalize uh, the economy to make it more productive uh, and to unleash uh, entrepreneurial productive economic activity. Um, so part of the, perhaps part of the neglect um, part, part of the, the engagement, uh, I should say, uh, by liberals towards social movements is 
uh, is exemplified by, by a neglect, as I've mentioned. Uh, but alternatively, you will see a strain of uh, liberal literature, uh, not necessarily entirely academic work, but uh, sometimes popular work, which treats uh, sort of social movements as adherent or irrational impulses uh, within uh, society, which uh, may sort of earn uh, the disapprobation, right, of uh, liberals on account of uh, a perception of social movement participation and agitation for change as being merely some form of rent-seeking. Now, let, let me be quite clear. Uh, there are numerous social movements uh, which um, either operate or are inspired by anti-liberal principles. Let's make that very, very clear. Um, however, um, what I'm saying in the book, what I'm uh, trying to uh, sort of expose uh, through this book is that not every social movement is actually acted uh, in a liberal fashion. Many social movements, in fact, have acted functionally in pro-liberty directions or have advocated for causes uh, in pro-liberty directions. So, um, so my book is effectively a call for uh, my fellow classical liberals to essentially not throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of their uh, analyses and uh, conceptualizations of social movements, especially during a time when uh, the, the, the multifaceted effects of economic, political and societal repression that people are experiencing uh, in contemporary societies is actually inducing impulses toward social movement activities such as protest. Um, these, what, these phenomena warrant investigation. We can use the tools of liberal political economy to analyze and understand these drivers of change. Okay, well, that's that's a, um, a nice segue actually into the to the next question I was going to to pursue with you. Um, so, within what you describe as as liberal political economy, you're really looking at three uh, strands of work, and I'd like to sort of explore these a little bit in terms of what they mean with regard to social movements. So you identify the three strands as being um, Austrian economics, the Bloomington School of Political Economy of the, the Austrians, and then also the, the public choice tradition. Now, if we start off with the, the Austrian tradition, the focus there is very strongly on entrepreneurship. And in that tradition, in market contexts, entrepreneurs are, understood to be actors who spot opportunities or gaps in the market and in the process they push the market closer to a more coordinated state. But you also have the more um, destabling aspect of entrepreneurship which is emphasized in that tradition whereby creating new products and organizational forms, entrepreneurship acts as a form of creative destruction which can be quite sort of disruptive in the overall social order, even though in the longer term it might lead to, to progress. So I wonder what are the analogs to these different entrepreneurial functions when we think about social movements? What's the analog to the kind of equilibrating function and to the destabilization function when we think about social movements? Now, I, I think it's quite true to uh, suggest that uh, varied social movements uh, do operate tactically and strategically uh, along various uh, spectra. Uh, one of which being uh, whether a social movement wants to achieve its change objectives in a moderate or accommodative fashion given existing institutions. And so that sort of then implicitly leads to a Kirzenerian impulse of uh, societal or might even more accurately say contentious entrepreneurship. Uh, so, uh, this this kind this impulse of um, entrepreneurship uh, would uh, blend very well actually with uh, the the thought of the Ostroms, which we'll discuss later. But I'll sort of preempt by saying that uh, one way in which uh, social movements might actually carry out a Kurzneriian style of entrepreneurship is through their sort of selection amongst competing political jurisdictions, alternative political jurisdictions in terms of um, the most effective pathways 
uh, for uh, success. So, uh, you know, for, for example, if you have a low tax uh, social movement, uh, they might seek to petition uh, um, a, a conservative government in the UK or a Republican uh, sort of state government, for example, or even federal government in, in the US in the, the hope of um, achieving a political accommodation for their goals. In terms of, uh, in terms of a more Schumpeterian disruptive entrepreneurship, this maps, I would think, rather neatly to a conceptualization of social movements, not as not pursuing moderate goals, but those um, that pursue radical goals. And these are ones that actually tend to attract uh, a lot of uh, public and media attention, it must be admitted. Um, so in, in this sort of sense, we see a, a, a wide array of uh, so social movement activities, which can be uh, publicly uh, disruptive. For example, if we think about uh, even in, in my country in recent days, there have been uh, sort of public protests by the Extin Extinction Rebellion uh, movement that have blocked roadways. So, you know, you know this is a very disruptive uh, sort of form of contention that they're applying. Um, um, another form of sort of radicalism, which is actually very intriguing and uh, is, I believe, very deserving and warrantable of uh, further study by classical liberals, uh, are forms of radical social movements which are organisationally aimed to prefigure um, the kinds of radical changes in society that they wish to see. So I know that you have a uh, interest in deliberative uh, democracy uh, theory and uh, many radical social movements of a Schumpeterian style of entrepreneurship uh, tend to sort of try to uh, embrace uh, those sort of prefigurative modes of deliberative democracy, consensual decision-making, de-hierarchy, um, and, and so on and so forth, which they hope to sort of transpose into the broader society. Can I just finally sort of introduce um, just a, sort of another sort of element of entrepreneurship into the picture? Um, what is very important to understand is that uh, a key element of success for social movements and their durability is the ability of activists, participants and supporters to bind collectively together, um, you know, in a sort of network structure that, that's sort of reasonably coherent. And part, and I think a key ingredient behind that, not in every case, not in these, certainly not in the radical ones, but in other styles of social movements, you need norm entrepreneurs. Um, I refer to, I, I think, probably an excellent example uh, in my consideration of uh, norm entrepreneurship and social movement behavior being that of the great Martin Luther King, uh, you know, the, the great norm entrepreneur who pushed the case for anti-racism and civil rights in the US. So, uh, so entrepreneurship is not only uh, evidenced in terms of the kinds of actions and activities that people will choose to do together uh, through these interesting collective phenomena, but also in terms of the use of framing devices and emo emotional pull, language and narrative uh, to sort of help bind and make social movements more durable. Not, not entirely successful, um, you know, entrepreneurship uh, is subject to uh, errors, right? And from errors come learnings. Uh, but nonetheless, I think this is where an Austrian approach can be most fruitfully applied to the study of social movements. I mean, what, what you just uh, said there strikes me as being very reminiscent of, if you're thinking about a movement as in, you know, trying to organise quite a complex structure of different actors, and therefore you might need different frames to sort of bring them together overlapping. It's very similar to um, Ludwig uh, Lachmann's ideas about uh, capital as a complex structure where you have different sort of complementary or discomplementary elements. And what the entrepreneur has to do is kind of figure out which bits fit together in some more or less coherent manner. Um, pr precisely. Um, the, 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 the use of framing devices is, is quite fascinating, um, not least for the fact that many um, social movements which have functionally operated in a, or agitated in a pro-liberty direction actually use um, uh, descriptions of freedom as something of a master frame, right? And mm -hmm. under that, 
Uh, there will be sort of very specific sort of framing devices which are used to uh, sort of diagnose the, the sort of heart of the problems that people experience, for example, a lack of freedom in terms of um, your racism in law and society, right? And then, uh, then, then there will be uh, sort of prognostic uh, sort of frames to think about what kinds of solutions uh, are required. So, for example, then from that kind of prognostic frame can spin off either uh, legislative petitioning or bureau bureaucratic petitioning or um, modes of communication and reasoning uh, with other members of society, particularly including uh, people who harbour uh, sort of racialist uh, attitudes and the sort of desire to sort of, you know, weaken the integrity um, of those malign viewpoints. I wonder, I wonder if we could just work out, just work through an example to illustrate some of these different themes. So, I mean, the example I was thinking about in terms of if you think of a distinction between a kind of more equilibrating view of an entrepreneur and a, dis, a more sort of disruptive view and then this challenge of coordinating or keeping different elements together if you think about the, the, the sort of gay liberation or gay rights movement um when people were pushing for gay marriage you could understand that as being a kind of incremental equilibrating function to say there's a gap here where there's an inconsistency um, on the other hand you could see more radical elements in that movement saying that this is not about gay marriage this is about uh, gay lifestyles as some kind of exemplar of an alternative mode of existence to the conventional family so you have radical groups like the ACT UP organization which I think you do actually mention at some point in the book which was actually saying um, you know, you shouldn't be necessarily going for marriage. It should be something that's radically opposed to that. And then if you think of this idea of a sort of network, keeping a movement together, what the entrepreneurs got to do, um, the challenge there is um, a movement might be united in having, you know, wanting more rights for gay people. But if within the movement there are schisms between those who want the marriage view and those who want this more radical view, then the entrepreneurs have kind of got to figure out figure out how that works. Is that a reasonable example, do you think? I think it's a very reasonable example. I don't use the um, example of um, LGBT rights movements in that context, but I think it's entirely reasonable. Um, I uh, sort of draw a similar kind of uh, sort of analytical thematic with respect to the civil rights movement uh, in yeah. the United States in that uh, surely um, um, all most members of uh, the civil rights social movement uh, would accept a, an agenda of racial equality in the abstract, in the broad. Um, mm. What are the tactical means to help achieve that? What does racial equality look like? Well, you know, quite frankly, in different individuals and in different subsets within the civil rights movement will have competing alternative perspectives. And this was seen in terms of the eventual uh, sort of breakup of the civil rights movement in the US from the more moderate uh, sort of legislative directive uh, mode of pushing for change, which, you know, came in terms of the Civil Rights Act versus the more radical sort of uh, movements like Black Panthers and so on that wanted to sort of seek, you know, broader sort of structural change uh, in the economy to reduce elements of racial stratification, to reduce uh, what they saw as sort of systemic uh, sort of underpinnings of uh, racism sort of uh, baked into uh, US culture. Um, to, to come back uh, to the LGBT example, I think it's a great example. Uh, one could sort of effective, effectively say, uh, not, not, in, not in all parts, but in most parts, a uh, good example, Kersnerian sort of entrepreneurship maps, as, a, as I mentioned again, uh, toward, as I mentioned uh, previously to uh, sort of moderate social movements that seek to actually work with informal politics to seek mm. incremental change without too much disruption the rest of the society. Uh, in, in that respect, uh, social movement advocates are merely uh, sort of seeking to uh, change structures of formal law, uh, which are seen as discriminatory in terms of black and white uh, legislation. Um, alternatively, uh, we have seen, and this is again um, uh, illustrated in social movements literature, particularly with respect to so-called new social movement theory, which came out of Europe 
uh, from the 80s, which broadened uh, sort of the remit of social movements away from the sort of marginalist, moderate, accommodative, Kersnerian style of uh, social movement uh, contention and agitation toward a uh, more expansive, disruptive one in which um, they would argue, we would take the LGBT example again, where, you know, groups would say that, uh, you know, the, the whole question for example, if marriage is symptomatic of broader, you know, uh, somehow sort of structural repression, you know, with uh, in the broader society in terms of uh, the treatment of variegated so sexualities and gender identities and so on. So these more radical groups would uh, try to attach uh, sort of strategic uh, imperatives towards changing cultural meanings, right, within society. So extra legislative agitation and contention, trying to reason with people in, through various public forums, you know, newspapers and, you know, public halls back then, social media now, um, you know, to, uh, to ask for effectively an equality of respect and also a modicum of sort of dignity, um, not sort of formalized or achieved necessarily. Uh, through the structure of formal politics itself, but through broader society changes in attitudes and norms. Okay, well, you already mentioned um, in that response, I think a, a little bit about, um, or maybe the earlier response about the, the Bloomington School. And I wonder if we could go on to think about what that might have to say about these, these movements. So the way I was thinking about it, on the one hand, you could think about this perspective would talk about the organizational challenge of actually getting one of these movements off the ground, because you can think of the Ostroms pointing out that standard neoclassical economic theory talks about a lot of collective action type situations where it predicts that because of the structure of the situation, the group won't be organized. And in some regards, it's quite surprising that large social movements do organize because they do face a significant, if you look at it in abstract terms, collective action problem. So one aspect of this might be, well, how do they overcome the, this collective action um, problem? Um, the other aspect, I guess, would be, can you see the maintenance of the network as a kind of self-governing arrangement um, that the in, internally the groups have to come out with mechanisms to govern their sort of internal operation, which are sort of from the ground up and spontaneous rather than being imposed by a sort of group leader, because very often these movements don't have a leader. They don't have a, a hierarchy that can impose a set of internal rules. Yes, I, look, I, I think both of those interpretations are, are very applicable through um, a Ostromian uh, lens. Uh, a, a very good example of uh, the, the second uh, sort of strain of uh, consideration is the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement, which, um, you know, to some extent sort of has some uh, sort of pro-capitalist uh, elements to it, I would argue, to the extent that they would actually seek to reduce inequalities, which are uh, induced by, um, uh, by uh, regressive governmental legislation and law, treatment of uh, financial markets and, and so on. And so one of the sort of the great challenges for, uh, the, for the Occupy movement uh, was to try to actually arrive at decisions um, in, the, in the sort of context of um, aspirations expressed by um, founding members of the movement to actually have a non-hierarchical, a decentralized network structure of engagement by like-minded people. Um, so, you know, so what you would practically sort of have um, in basically sort of a, a de democratic praxis, you'd have a, a whole range of, you know, public meetings and sub-discussion groups and emergent subcommittees within different geographic branches of the Occupy Wall Street movement. I refer to uh, a study in my book which refers to Occupy Wall Street in London and how, um, how they emergently tried to organize and make decisions. Now, the, the great challenge uh, there, especially for these more radical, sort of um, de-hierarchical, pre-figurative pre um, sort of phenomena, 
uh, is that um, uh, is the ability of is the, the very ever present ability of individual members to splinter off uh, from a, a network uh, to the extent that they actually disagree uh, with some of the decisions or even some of the objectives that are uh, sort of spelt out. I mean, we have to uh, have to understand that uh, social movements, just like any sort of collective form, uh, are quite highly uh, are not only improvisational but very fluid and very dynamic in, in their character. And the, I guess, ironically, the nature of contentiousness, which social movements often promulgate within society, may lead to the seeds of their own destruction internally, in the sense that you'll actually have dissensus, right? disagreement, um, splintering, forking away, if you will, um, from original groups. So that's one element. Um, the um, sort of second element is, how in the, the face of this uh, uncertainty uh, potentially uh, rendered by a, the, the, the collapse of a social movement, how um, is one actually able to sustain a network? And this is again where we bring in uh, the sort of um, non sort of economic um, incentives, for example, the use of affect, the use of emotion, uh, the use of storytelling and narrative uh, to bind people socially together uh, toward a common cause. And a lot of improvisation entrepreneurship is required um, in order to uh, sort of advance compelling narratives which help cohere um, a social uh, movement. And uh, indeed, Eleanor Ostrom in her separate studies about the management of the commons uh, alludes to uh, the fact that, you know, collective uh, action uh, possibilities um, are, are far more feasible than that uh, than predicted by Mansur Olson uh, in his 1965 The Logic of Collective Action. An important reason why collective action is uh, seems, appears far more feasible in the real world and actually existing societies than under Olson's uh, sort of maudlin model um, is that people actually use narrative, uh, emotion, other forms of affect to help bind these networks together. Again, you know, they're not fail-safe mechanisms, but um, these are mechanisms which exist to help people uh, sort of interact, to congeal and uh, to, to, to functionally unite uh, to some extent. And, and again, and dovetailing with the first um, sort of aspects, uh, an important part of encouraging, incentivizing ongoing participation is by virtue of uh, maintaining some sort of um, participatory sort of democracy or meaningful participation for people that members of social groups internally feel that they have some uh, real uh, sort of stake, right, in the operation of the, the movement in which they support. And I guess this connects really the previous discussion about entrepreneurship um, in terms of, you know, what is it that entrepreneurs in these movements do? And it strikes me that one of the things they might do is to um, try to use identity or you know the, the creation or construction of an of an identity um, as a way of getting people not to be thinking in sort of free rider terms. So the free rider motive doesn't even come into play if people are thinking in a certain vein. And the trick of a a kind of identity entrepreneur is to try to construct an identity for people in such a way that you know they automatically want to sort of be expressing themselves by participating in the group. So it, it becomes a kind of non-excludable benefit to, or, or sorry, an excludable benefit that you, you have to participate in order to, to get that, to express that identity. Yeah, so uh, norm, norm entrepreneurship intersects with uh, a very interesting notion, which is uh, increasingly impairing an economic uh, thought from Akalof onwards in terms of thinking about an identity uh, entrepreneurship to, to construct, to socially construct a uh, sort of a, a set of modes of identity by which people can bind together. And uh, if I can go back to the, the civil rights example in the US, 
Um, and again, sort of defying this idea that the civil rights movement was some sort of uh, homogenous unitary whole, uh, we, we see in uh, first-hand accounts of activities in the social, uh, in the civil rights movement and, and in secondary accounts, um, a, a certain extent of social cajoling, cajoling and pressure, right, exerted uh, amongst uh, people, for example, that attend uh, church congregations in the South and other uh, meeting places uh, to sort of suggest to people, please uh, join us in our protest, please join us in our lunch uh, counter sit-ins and the like, uh, because you don't want to be uh, identified, right, using the term identity, you don't want to be identified as are not supporting anti-racism campaigns. You're one of us, aren't you, uh, in, in effect? Mm. So um, uh, identity uh, can, can be powerfully be used as a salve uh, to reduce the relative costs of uh, coordination uh, within, uh, within social movement network structures and organizational structures too. I mean, I guess, I mean, perhaps we can explore this a little bit more later on, but I guess the, the, the possible downside of that is if identity is um, a tool that entrepreneurs use to mobilize people, one of the most effective ways to generate an identity is to create a distinction between in-groups and out-groups. So you basically have a sort of warlike notion of rival identities that are clashing against each other. So it's a bit like... Um, you know, what people people talk about expressive incentives. So um, I don't I don't follow um, football that much actually these days. But you know, if you do go to a, a football match, um, people who throw abuse at the, um, the 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 opposing team, they don't actually think that their sort of individual contribution makes that much difference. They're not thinking collective action terms. They're expressing their identity. That you, you know, you hate Manchester United or you hate Arsenal or whoever it might be. Um, and that's very effective for, you know, mobilising people. That's why a lot of people go to watch football matches. But it is a very confrontational um, environment. And if you get the same in the sense of this is why people join social movements, it's kind of to hurl abuse almost against another movement or a counter movement. Um, that's also potentially quite destabilizing and you, you do have very conflictual situations and I mean maybe you need conflict because if certain groups are campaigning for their rights that's understandable but at the same time you have the issue of well you know how do you work out a peaceful compromise if, if that kind of very strong identification is what underlies the mobilization. Oh, look I, I think that's entirely true and this is one of the sort of the great contemporary challenges which are uh, sort of brought to a head by uh, an, in an increase in social movement activity in, in my view and this also corresponds with uh, with the I, I think the rather unfortunate uh, trend uh, in western societies and other societies toward uh, tribalism. Uh, so I do wrestle with this um, idea uh, to some extent, uh, in fact more to just to some extent uh, in my book. Um, I explicitly recognize um, a framework of uh, sort of realism uh, in political philosophy, um, which, uh, which is sort of evident in some of the works of, for example, John Gray and Chantal Mouffe and uh, others, and even going back to uh, the notorious figure Carl Schmitt, uh, who uh, consider uh, the presence within societies of uh, different uh, competing uh, sort of uh, sets of groups within society, perhaps uh, inspired and fashioned along sort of identity lines that see themselves as um, as enemies versus friends. And uh, to the extent that um, increasing social movement activity bubbles along and formed by those lines, then the downside of uh, such uh, thinking and, and that thinking uh, sort of uh, melding into practice is that um, there will be limits on the basis upon which uh, consensus and agreement uh, will be able to be reached on uh, important um, agendas of social change to address societal problems. I do um, address at length in the book 
um, the the um, the virtues of liberal toleration uh, to be able to discover margins by which people who have competing frameworks about the good life in society are able uh, to be able to communicate, be able to engage in meaningful and productive discourse with each other, to understand each other's point of view and to see if uh, perhaps in a sort of Kuznary arbitrage fashion to see if there are any sort of margins of uh, agreement and accommodation by which divergent groups can move forward. But, um, but the ability to do this will be sort of very much contingent on people uh, sort of easing up on very strong tribal or identitarian um, ways of uh, congealing with social movement activity. There must be, there must be space by which, um, you know, reasonable people uh, can disagree and reasonable people um, that have uh, that carry diverse and alternative uh, frameworks and views about the, the good life are able to find spaces within society in order uh, to uh, sort of uh, instantiate their beliefs and viewpoints. I'm almost uh, mentioning a sort of Nozickian sort of meta-utopia uh, kind of conception here where uh, people have space in the room, you know, to be able to experiment uh, in living and to uh, to and from that you can be able to compare and contrast in a, in a reasonably robust way what kind of forms of social movement preferred forms of uh, the world um, actually seem more feasible and popular I wonder if we could just go on I mean if we we've, we've spoken there about um, the sort of self-organization aspect of, of these kind of movements. I wonder if we could think about the, the public choice aspect, which I guess overlaps a little bit with this. And that's, we can think about um, these entrepreneurs um, in social movements overcoming the organizational or the collective action problem. I guess the, the other sort of more public choice angle on this would be, how do we understand what these groups are actually doing? Um, so, one view would be that they are, in many circumstances, really pushing for an extension of rights to people who haven't had them. So this is a kind of, you know, an egalitarian type view that certain groups, whether it's um, ethnic minority groups, um, different sexual identities, etc., just want to have the same treatment as other actors, and that they are pushing for equality in a certain sense. You can have another interpretation, which is that they are, and I think you, the, maybe the Occupy Wall Street would fall into this category, where they're complaining about what they see as perceived privileges that are given to other actors. So why are some banks considered to be too big to fail or something of that kind when others are not? So it's a, a complaint about inequality in that sense. So those two dimensions can be seen as being um, quite liberal in orientation. But I guess the third aspect, which is what a lot of public choice thinkers would be would be concerned about, is is this a form of rent seeking? Illiberal social movements exist, and we can't we can't sort of hand wave that away. Um, I what I also acknowledge in the in the book and what I try to uh, sort of illustrate quite painstakingly is that there are actually a range of social movements uh, it, that sort of operate uh, uh, with objectives that are very similar to other groups in society that push for uh, deregulation, reduced uh, sort of fiscal size and scale of government, uh, like interest groups, think tanks and, and other groups that are not necessarily uh, sort of tagged with the, the label of being uh, rent seekers. So I think of a couple of uh, sort of social movements, for example, the Yes in My Backyard movement, the very prominent uh, social movement in the United States and also I, I'm aware also in England and the UK and elsewhere, uh, which is seeking to liberalise housing supply to address what is an extremely severe housing affordability problem. We referred to the example of the, uh, the, the queer social movement ACT UP, um, ACT UP during the 80s and 90s were uh, heavily and actively campaigning against uh, the effect of intellectual property restrictions, which increase the relative prices of drugs. Um, I refer in the book in one of the chapters to a host of contemporary social movements, 
which are working against what uh, Brink Lindsay and Steve Tellis call the captured economy, right? That is the economy which is basically coagulated by uh, re regressive regulation and fiscal policy. Now, I would have thought that um, certainly to be, you know, it's true that the social movements, just like every other individual or collective entity, will expend some resources in order to advocate uh, for deregulation, for economic uh, freedom. But I would think in the spirit of my trying to separate wheat from chaff, uh, is uh, that we, we ought to be able to very carefully delineate and try to identify those social movements which are functionally aiming towards causes that um, economic liberals uh, would, uh, would equally um, uh, agree with and to recognise that uh, the, so the, the fount of advocacy within society in a, in a liberty direction is actually multifaceted and not necessarily restricted to formal politics, even if uh, social movements, especially of the moderate, more accommodative uh, type, are engaging quite heavily uh, with uh, sort of formal politics. Um, I just want to sort of uh, just emphasise something about uh, the sort of the public choice uh, sort of framework, which um, which I sort of stress quite uh, quite extensively in in my book, and that is that. Um, I think uh, social movements provide uh, public choice theorists with an opportunity to better understand the dimension of political activity outside of a constitution making or an election setting. Um, oh, I outline in the book, um, inspired by the work of the, the great late economist Don Lavoie, um, a model of extensive democracy. I call it Lavoyan democracy, right? And, and it's very, um, it's very, very similar in spirit to Buchanan 1954, where Buchanan is basically saying that in terms of social choice, um, you know, dynamism is actually not a bug, but actually a feature, right, of democratic uh, process because people are liable to change their minds and they're actually allowed to in liberal democratic societies. Lavoyan democracy sort of extends on that by saying that um, you know, um, it, the, there is actually um, benef societal benefits associated with social movements and other groups um, engaging in discourse and uh, activism and related activities, which signal information uh, about the kinds of social problems that exist. Um, social movements, I, in my view, by and large, even the liberal ones, right, it, um, do provide valuable information that serve as an input, right? I'm speaking in quite economistic terms, of course, but serve as an input into a dynamic Lavoyan democratic process where politics doesn't end after the setting of a constitution or the um, announcement of a winner of a general election ballot. Uh, so I think uh, social movements in, uh, pro-liberal social movements particularly, sort of challenging um, the, the basis of hegemonic power um, that acts in illiberal ways, I think uh, uh, is an important potential fount uh, for uh, the increasing in the uh, sort of exercise of liberty as, as we practically appreciate it uh, today. I mean, th this, is a, this is a difficult area. Because, I mean, what, I, what I was thinking of is, my own view would be a, a lot of social movements, it's actually very hard to characterize them as rent seekers, as public choice theory would do. I think my feeling is that most social movements, it will be inappropriate to think of them in that way. I think where it gets complicated is when you introduce, as you do so effectively in the book, this idea of entanglement, the idea that movements aren't um, a sort of clearly distinct thing. They sort of overlap with other actors in multiple sectors. So if we take an example, um, I think most of the people who are involved in the fair trade social movement, I wouldn't characterize them as rent seekers. I think they have an ideal of improving working conditions or whatever for people in certain countries who are uh, low income farmers. I think the problem is that the discourse they use about fairness, um, about improving conditions, which 
many people would sort of subscribe to in a universalistic sense can then be taken on by other actors um, to regularize, to regulate, and potentially to shut out from the market low-cost producers. So what is an enlightened discourse in a sense can actually facilitate something from other actors which isn't particularly enlightened in its effect. And there's no reason that all social movements would have that effect, but it's going to be a very complex mix, isn't it, in any particular case about how these things play out. Yeah, so to, to be able to sort of cleanly sort of identify uh, the sort of the inspiration outcome effects of social movements are, are complicated. And uh, it is important for us to acknowledge, as I have done in the book, that uh, in, in the spirit of entangled political economy, uh, which straddles, incidentally, Austrian Bloomington and Virginia political economy, that um, many social movements uh, directly petition businesses, major corporations, even smaller ones, uh, to uh, sort of to drive uh, particular changes that are preferred uh, by the participants of uh, social movements, and we we might sort of collectively regard uh, such uh, such a domain of agitation as being reflected in corporate social responsibility or a social license or the concept of social uh, justice. Uh, it, it is a complicated area. I sort of take some inspiration from recent work by Pete Bocker, um, uh, Paul Dragas, Aligica and Vlad Tarko, who uh, uh, introduce a very intriguing uh, sort of refinement of uh, sort of, of uh, stakeholder theory, which they coin polycentric stakeholder theory, which suggests that, I guess in a normative sense, it's not entirely um, illegitimate, uh, of course, in, a, uh, sort of in, in free societies for businesses to uh, be receptive, to any, for any given business to be receptive uh, to uh, demands of not only of their direct, direct customers, but of broader constituencies that you know, may consume their products or not, or otherwise uh, sort of affected um, uh, through externalities and, and, and uh, similar uh, effects. Um, it, um, and I guess even in some sort of partial defense of uh, the populist refrain of so-called woke capitalism, I, I admittedly, I actually provide a, something of a partial defense of that. So long as businesses that are receptive to that essentially sort of pay for, uh, you know, for, for such uh, changes uh, themselves um, and uh, sort of don't, uh, don't sort of seek to sort of disperse sort of costs upon sort of unwilling parties now, of course, of course, I mean, that is an ever present uh, risk in any sort of contemporary society. And so uh, one might well best say that uh, a, an effective response to that is uh, eternal vigilance <laughs> in, in response to uh, response to the potential and very real threat that you outline that um, that very worthy, meritorious, even pro-liberty cause, uh, causes may be sort of twisted uh, for um, oppositional intentions. Okay, Mikhailo, well, that's, that's, um, that's great. We've, we've covered a lot of ground. I think we're coming up to about an hour. So um, I wonder if we could just finish off by um, you just letting us know what you're thinking of working on next. Where are you going to go beyond this, um, this book project? Are you doing anything else on social movements or are you moving on to other things? Um, certainly sort of looking to, to move on to other things, but I certainly see that um, a, a core aspect of my own research agenda uh, in sociology moving forward will sort of focus on social movements. Uh, a couple of potential uh, areas for investigation is to further dig down uh, into the relationship between social movements and businesses, particularly financial markets. I'm working on a uh, book chapter at the moment, so looking at the relationships between uh, social movement participation and financial market changes. And this has great relevance in relation to the GameStop developments that we saw uh, through Reddit um, earlier uh, this year. And this, this might become increasingly important. So uh, there's that. Um, there's also a broader uh, agenda, which I briefly alluded to uh, earlier during uh, this, uh, this uh, podcast, and, and that is that uh, there is actually very great potential, I believe, for 
uh, sort of uh, liberals who are uh, um, who are amenable to studies in so-called analytical anarchism to actually understand how anarchist social movements operate, right? Uh, using the lenses of particularly the Austrian and Bloomington schools to understand how these sort of prefigurative anarchist movements actually combine to sustain their networks if they can sustain them. Uh, so I think there is a very uh, great agenda to sort of recalibrate social movement theory to uh, sort of move away from merely thinking of them as uh, solely wishing to engage in formal politics and to think about social movements as genuinely wishing to uh, sort of engage in change in a non-state sphere of, of culture, of uh, persuasion, of uh, narrative and, and affect. There's much more uh, to, to be done there. Um, in terms of other potential work, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, sort of visiting the sort of uh, the, the, the history and the sort of contemporary developments of freedom as they affect different minority groups, for example, LGBT groups. So I'm currently investigating that. And as well as uh, general studies in entangled uh, political, the entangled political economy approach, which was originated by uh, Dick Wagner at GMU. So a, a lively uh, cornucopia of, of uh, research, and I'll be very happy to sort of share uh, the outcomes of that research uh, with, with you and with the centre in your course. Well, that's great. Um, I mean, it, that's, that's a very exciting agenda, and um, I very much enjoyed the, the doing this podcast with you, Mikaela, and hopefully um, people will be very interested in, in getting this new book. So just to remind everyone, the book's called Freedom in Contention, Social Movements and Liberal Political Economy, and that's published by Lexington Books. So highly recommended. So thanks very much, Mikaela, and um, yeah, hope to talk to you again in the, the not too distant future. It's a great pleasure, Mark, and, and thank you for, for having me. Thank you for the opportunity.